U.S. President Barack Obama's oldest daughter, Malia, will begin studying at Harvard University in 2017. Malia will join a long line of presidents' children who have studied at the elite group of universities known as the Ivy League. So what is the appeal of an Ivy League education, and why are these schools so powerful? Harvard alone has produced more than 150 Nobel laureates, more than any other American university. This impressive pool of alumni is, in part, what makes an Ivy League degree so valuable. The designation implies a level of prestige that can lead to lucrative or otherwise successful careers. In fact, the Department of Education reported that the median annual income for Ivy League graduates after 10 years is more than double that of grads from all other higher education institutions. I've wanted to be an Ivy League student since I was in middle school, but gaining admission was no small feat. My family guided me as best as they could, but ultimately, none of us knew what getting in really entailed. I worked for hours on my essays, poured all my time into extracurriculars, and always focused on this dream of mine. It seemed so far out of reach, until March 28, 2019, I got in. When the opportunity is presented to you, that a better future is not as far off as you think it is, that wealth, freedom, and life of bliss is yours for the taking. When these things are dangled in front of you like a carrot on a stick, when it sounds too good to be true, but believing otherwise means losing hope, why would you refuse? Why would you question it? There is this theory that there are three types of students who get into the Ivy League schools. The well-rounders, the pointy students, and the students with interesting stories. Ivy League has been around for a long time now. And if you're not familiar with this category of schools, then perhaps you're familiar with the schools that fall within this category. These are schools with endowments in the billions, international in reach. Sounds just fine, doesn't it? On the surface, they may seem like ordinary schools. Elite, sure, but something you may never take a second glance at. But once you go beyond the surface level and uncover what's underneath. Have you ever wanted to go to an Ivy League school? If so, in this video, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about where is the bar that you have to jump over to potentially get into an Ivy League school. Again, I ask you, if it sounds too good to be true, but believing otherwise means losing hope, why would you refuse? Why would you question it? It's important that you pay very close attention now. Because when an application trap is presented to you, it will not reveal itself as such. It will come wrapped in a well-decorated packaging with a pretty bow on the top disguised as a shortcut to the school of your dream. Disguised as a way to have a surefire way to succeed and guarantee your admission into any school you want. When it presents itself to you, it will not come dressed in the robes of unfamiliar advice. It will come dressed as your best friend's sage wisdom, your neighbor's expert advice, information from someone you admire, someone you love. His message will be that of hope, opportunity in getting everything you've ever wanted. It'll come disguised as anything and everything but that which it actually is. Consider the next two parts of this video a simulation for a common collective experience for many who apply to these well-known schools. There are nuances to them all, but the overarching story remains relatively the same. We'll discuss the details later, and how reflective this model is of reality and the experience as a whole. But for now, sit back, relax, and brace yourselves. This is the pitch. It's a message, an idea. The platform through which it's heard from doesn't really matter but they have the exact advice you need to get into your dream school. It seems harmless on the surface, maybe a little extreme, but you either click on the video 
or listen some more and enter the rabbit hole. Then they mention it. The foolproof, surefire way to get into the school of your dreams. And more importantly, it'll work for everyone, including you. They explain that this method is changing lives. It's changed a number of lives. And again, you'd be perfect for it. Phrases like more extracurriculars, better AP test scores, better SAT scores, more leadership roles seem to float around effortlessly in their statements. It all sounds great, but there's still that feeling that something's not quite right. You click on a video or decide to continue listening and it's all positive. People are smiling, cheering, jumping up and down as they receive their offers from Princeton, Harvard, Stanford, and Yale. This method seems to work. And then someone comes on mouthing off some words of motivation, stating how hard work and smart work can get anyone into the school of their dreams. And as they're speaking, those phrases you heard before appear again. More extracurriculars, better AP test scores, better SAT scores, and more leadership roles. It makes sense. The more you have to offer, the better odds you'll have for getting into any college you want, right? That's just how these things work. You tell yourself you'll think about it. And although something feels a little bit off, you can't help but feel drawn to these ideas. You browse through some other videos of the students who are accepted and see things which reinforce the message. These students did do a number of extracurriculars. They had phenomenal grades and were leaders at their school. And as you scroll, those phrases start running through your head again. More extracurriculars better AP test scores, better SAT scores, more leadership roles. It makes perfect sense. To get more, you have to do more, right? After a few days, you reach out to a friend to talk about this. And although something doesn't feel quite right, the promise of a greater life has enticed you enough to enter. It starts the summer before your freshman year. This is important, you're told. This is the start of the high school career that will either make or break your chances for getting into the school of your dreams. You're told that every single second counts and that every second not spent building on your resume is a second you fall behind someone who is. After all, that's what it takes to get into the Ivy League, right? You create a checklist of things you need to do to get into those top schools. And as you mark things off the list one by one, you feel better and better about your odds of getting into those schools of your dreams. YouTube video after YouTube video tells you that you're on the right track. They encourage you to study harder, participate in more extracurriculars, and get better grades. But there are only so many hours in a day. You seem to be losing those close friendships you've built over the years. Stuck between books, and club meetings, or watching more YouTube videos. Before you can start worrying about that, you're hit with another motivational video. There are key components and key ingredients in the recipe of a student mentality. Number one, you need to be disciplined. The future is very expensive, and only those who are carriers of discipline can inherit the future. The usual motivational speech begins. You're told that the sacrifices you'll make to achieve this dream will be worth it. That's possible but only if you work really, really hard at it. You're told that you have to stay positive. The negative people will get in your way, but you must rise above it no matter what. It's simple. The harder you work at everything, the better you'll do. You start working harder, studying longer, spending less and less time with other people trying to get those extra points for an A+. Once more, you're told that you must invest in yourself. You continue watching the motivational videos, pushing yourself to the absolute limit. Everything and everyone tells you that you're on the right track, but you're spreading yourself too thin. You're showered with more stories about others who are living the dream thanks to their hard work. A little bit goes by and you're starting to burn out. Your friends who you were close with before aren't as close with you anymore. Perhaps some chose to maintain a connection with you but when it came to actively hang out with you, you just couldn't get them to cross that bridge. More studying, club meetings, sports, motivation. 
then bam, you get your first bad grade and you are devastated. It's because you haven't worked hard enough. You weren't thinking positive enough. So you double down, thinking that the solution to the problem was simply working harder and thinking more positively. And as the time goes on, you start to reassess your values. Your friends weren't interested in going as hard as you. It just means that you need new friends. You're told to study more, sacrifice more, give more. You're told that it would be enough to make your resume stand out and help you get exactly what you want. Hope and belief keeps you going. A couple of years pass and now it's the summer after your sophomore year. That summer, you and your family decide to visit one of these elite and prestigious schools. It's an absolute spectacle. Flashing lights, performances, motivation, the dream is once more sold to you. A fresh wave of motivation overcomes you. This is your community, your family, people of like-minded goals, opinions, ambitions, and interests. The cycle continues. You work harder, especially now that you're in more difficult AP level classes and work even longer to keep the dream alive. Work harder, stay positive, remove negative influences. It's all on you to make it happen. Work harder, stay positive, remove negative influences. It's all on you to make it happen. Perhaps you're starting to get a few leadership positions at your school, and suddenly, you're feeling a little bit better about your odds of getting into these exclusive schools. It may not be much, but it's a start, you tell yourself. You're officially a top student. You're officially at a level where you have a decent chance of getting into these exclusive schools. But the job isn't over yet. You need to invest more in yourself. You need to stay positive to work harder. It's essential to the dream. But there it comes again, that feeling. Something isn't quite right. Something just feels off. A look through your social media profile reveals a life whizzing right by you. People you once knew disappearing or drifting away. Bags under your eyes and sleepless nights piling up as you work for those extra accolades. A history full of motivational content you don't really believe. And old friends you don't really speak to anymore. But it will all be worth it, you tell yourself. When the day comes, it will all be worth it. Now fast forward to the spring of your senior year. Everything you've done in your high school career comes down to this one season. Will it all have been worth it? Your first application comes back from Harvard. Rejected. Your second one comes back from Stanford. Rejected. Your third from Princeton. Rejected. And you are absolutely crushed. But when you open up your social media profile, you see something that devastates you completely. A student who didn't work as hard, get the grades you got, nor the leadership positions you attained somehow received acceptance letters from all three of those schools. You did everything right, but they got the outcome you worked so hard for. You feel cheated, deceived, as though you were lied to about something, as though the truth of the matter has been concealed from you. And you'd be right. You see, before you join this race, there are some critical details that you should have understood about what you were getting yourself into. Stick with me now, because it's about time you find out exactly what these details were. The Ivy League and the additional Ivy League caliber schools are some of the most exclusive schools on the planet. While they have different specialties, locations, and demographics of applicants, what remains the same is their exclusivity and very, very low acceptance rates. Sounds just fine. They're just colleges with low acceptance rates. So what's the controversy? Over the last few years, there have been a number of reports and lawsuits exposing some of the alleged unsavory practices of these institutions of higher learning. 
There have been accusations of filling quotas, allowing families of wealthy students to buy their way into the universities, and giving a preference for students of the upper class. So is it a corrupt system? Not exactly. We'll get into that. Before we get there, let's talk a little history. The Ivy League schools have been around for a long while now, with roots that go as far back as the early 1600s. These schools have always been places of elite level learning and they have even taught notable figures in history such as JFK, who attended Harvard, James Madison, who attended Princeton, and William Howard Taft, who attended Yale. These places have always been places where people have gone to join the upper class of society and leave an impact on the world. And for the most part, this is still true to this day. Now this is especially true for women. Since 1969, when the majority of the Ivy League started to accept female applicants in great numbers, they simply taken over the application pool. Of all applicants to the Ivy League, 60% of them are female, with an almost majority representation in all these schools. However, if you look on Facebook, Instagram, or any other social media platform, for that matter, it won't take you long to find videos like this. In an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, Susie Weiss voiced her disappointment. She writes, Colleges tell you just be yourself. That is great advice as long as yourself has nine extracurriculars, six leadership positions, three varsity sports, killer SAT scores, and two moms. Susie Weiss appeared perfect for the Ivy League. An impressive 4.5 GPA, excellent SAT scores, plus a stint as a U.S. Senate page. Still, she was rejected by Princeton, Yale, Penn, and Vanderbilt. Among the reasons Susie says she was rejected, quote, diversity. I offer about as much diversity as a saltine cracker. She writes, I also probably should have started a fake charity, collecting donations for the underprivileged chimpanzees of the Congo. She even blames her parents, writing, I noticed long ago that my parents gave up on parenting me. I've never sat down at a piano, never plucked a violin. Still, the competition is steep. Princeton accepted only 7% of its over 26,000 applicants this year. Just because you're an A student and have great test scores doesn't mean you're eligible for an Ivy League school. Some call Susie a truth teller. Others say she's entitled. People who bought the dream of doing everything right to get into these sorts of schools and being swiftly rejected in favor of someone who didn't do half of these things. The controversy related to this topic is endless. One infamous example of such a situation occurred a few years ago when a number of families were busted for buying their children's spots in elite schools. A number of people served jail sentences and many called for the students to be suspended from the schools as they weren't deserving of it. And yet, despite this, the trend continues. So what's really going on here? Is the dream real or one big lie? Why does there seem to be a bias against certain groups of people? Why isn't this practice illegal? Do you know why the wealthy, as well as certain types of students, do exceptionally well when applying to elite schools, even in cases when the results are fairly mediocre when compared to other applicants? They either know, stumble upon, or benefit from an advantage so you don't know about. There are some tricks to the Ivy League, and those who know them, or accidentally use them, get a substantial advantage when applying to these types of schools. Keep that in mind. So when we see discrimination, or particular acceptance of certain types of students over others, it's not born out of a conscious desire by the university to discriminate between students, but instead comes about as a result of many students not understanding and using the tricks and special advantages they have to have better odds for getting to the school they want. Now these particular tips and tricks aren't revolutionary, but spotting them can sometimes be difficult because just like the best of secrets, they hide in plain sight, disguise as many things but that in which they actually are. Having danced around the topic long enough, let's talk about the main secret wealthy families know and use to get their children to elite schools that most people don't know.
Do you want to know the secret? Well, here it is. Not all colleges are the same. It's straightforward enough, but simply knowing this and understanding how each school picks its students gives you a significant advantage when applying to an elite school. Let me show you how. Every single school can be categorized into one of the following four categories. Business boroughs, technology towns, humanities havens, and political science paradises. And every student can be predominantly classified into one of the following five categories. STEM scholars, athletic academics, professional polymaths, social scientists, and humanities intellectuals. If you want to learn more about these different types of schools and students, I've included some helpful links in the description when making videos on these topics in the next coming weeks. But getting back to the topic at hand, each of these types of schools has a distinctive personality and profile which gives certain students an advantage over other types of students. For example, at Technology Towns, Professional polymaths, on average, have a significant edge, nearly a five times multiplier on the average acceptance rate when compared with other students in getting into these types of schools. To put this in perspective, let's say that you wanted to apply to a school like MIT, a clear technology town, as a professional polymath. While the average acceptance rate for any student to get into MIT is 7.3%, for you, it would be just over 36%. A huge increase in your odds of getting into the school. You go from a one in 14 chance to just over a one in three chance of getting into the school. Now let's change the scenario. Let's say that you applied to Stanford, a technology town as well, as a humanities intellectual. Well, the average acceptance rate is 5.2%. It would be an abysmal 1% for the average humanities intellectual who applied to Stanford. This simple understanding is what gives particular students a significant advantage in getting into specific schools. It's the one secret that lets them succeed in a way that seems almost rigged or biased. Nothing more, nothing less. What happens in most cases is that some students, when applying to a myriad of schools, accidentally fall into an advantageous situation and are able to get into the schools of their dreams. However, most don't do this, and as a result are unable to fulfill those desires and dreams despite the work and effort they put into doing so. This is what causes things like the bias against Asian students or the bias for wealthy students. It's not that the system is corrupt and people are being selected or rejected for certain traits they possess, but instead, some groups benefit from exploiting loopholes in the application process and are thus given a significant edge over those who do not. Here's a perfect example of how this could translate in the real world. Let's say two jobs opened up at Ford Motor Company. One job was for the CEO position and another job was for the regional manager position. For the CEO job, 10,000 people apply, each with their own respective qualifications and achievements hoping to get the job. On the flip side, for the regional manager position, only two people apply. Who is more likely to end up at the company? An applicant applying for the CEO position or an applicant applying for the regional manager position? While the CEO position requires more work than the regional manager position, there's much less competition for the latter position. And as a result, the person applying there has nearly a 50% chance of working at Ford compared to a one in 10,000 chance of working there as a CEO. This type of situation happens all the time in the college environment. Many people put themselves in very competitive marketplaces and as a result, face very difficult odds in getting into the schools they want. Wealthy students and students who know these secrets put themselves in a situation where there's not much competition and as a result face much better odds of getting into the schools of their dreams. But is my assessment of this too simplistic? The truth is, I can't comment on every student's individual situation. When a college application consists of a number of factors that influences whether a student gets accepted or rejected, each student needs to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. 
but let me point out some key things that I think every parent and student should be aware of. One, applying to the wrong type of school based on the type of student you are can reduce your chances of getting into that school to nearly zero. As mentioned before, a humanities intellectual applying to Stanford has a nearly 1 in 1,000 chance of making it into the school on average, while on the flip side, a professional polymath applying to a school of a similar status and difficulty, MIT, given that they meet the average prerequisites, has a nearly a 36% chance of making it into this school. 2. Wealthy families know the secrets and backdoor hacks to get into elite schools and use them to their advantage. The main reason why wealthy families have such an advantage over everyone else, even when their children may have a worse performance over a number of areas as compared with other students, is because they understand the specific areas they need to focus on to help get their children exactly where they want them to go. 3. When it comes to applying to college, working smart is much, much better than working hard. When it comes to college applications and life in general, you have to have a strategy. You definitely have to work hard. Working hard is important, but you have to figure out a way to work smart so that you're in the best position to get what you want. I can't comment on all students' circumstances, but I can say that if you're watching this and feel as though you want to go to one of the best schools in the country, then do your due diligence. If you're sold a dream and told that hard work in the absence of a strategy is all that it takes to achieve it, tread carefully. If you see that the majority of people who perform a certain behavior are not rewarded for that behavior, tread carefully. If you find that because of your work, you are distancing yourself from your friends and family or made to feel guilty for not succeeding because you didn't work hard enough, tread carefully. The pursuit of financial freedom or a better life are not uncommon dreams. They're shared by many, including myself, but if someone or something comes along promising you that goal, that dream, that vision, and dangling it in front of you like a carrot on a stick disguised as an opportunity, then it's best to pause, think rationally, and remember that if it sounds too good to be true, well, then it probably is. So something I need to make really clear is that I'm not against any of these colleges that advise students on how to get into these particular schools. What I am against though is the one size fits all approach many of these places use for a number of different students to help them get to schools like Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, etc. The reason for this is because each student has different strengths and weaknesses that they need to work on and use specifically to get into the types of schools they want. These type of programs, while great for a good number of students, won't work for many students and will oftentimes hurt them in the process, as will make them just like every other applicant. What every student really needs to do is to find out what works for them and use those particular tips, tricks, and strategies to help them get where they want to go. Every single student's path will be wildly different from everyone else's, and they need to figure out which paths they need to take personally that work for their lives, their situation, to help them get to these many different schools. Additionally, on the topic of corrupt colleges, something I believe is important to keep in mind is that although corruption does happen, and sometimes there are corrupt systems in place, on the whole, most colleges are honest enough that each individual student who's applying to an elite college like a Princeton, Harvard, Stanford, or Yale doesn't really need to worry about it too much in their actual application. It's good to know, it's good to keep in mind, but you don't really need to focus on or dwell on that fact too much. And finally, the most important thing I advise anyone take away from this is figure out what works for you. While there are general tips and tricks which work for all students, the most important thing someone can take away from this video is figure out with all these tips, tricks, advice, what will fit into your life and help you get where you want to go. Your path will be wildly different from everyone else's path, and it's your job to figure out the different strategies and avenues you need to take to help you get what you want. As always, thank you for watching. 
So what I plan on doing next week is breaking down the five different student types and the four different school types I talked about in this video and sort of going way more in depth into that topic and giving you guys sort of a strategy for each different student type on which schools to apply to, which schools to avoid, and how to present yourself in the best light so that you can get into the schools you want to get into. So this was a game changer for me and the students I've worked with as it's helped them sort of get a working strategy that they can use right away to position themselves in the right place to get into the schools they want. It's absolutely incredible. I suggest you tune in next week for all that awesome information. So if you like what you saw today, make sure you hit the like button, hit subscribe, and thank you for watching. I really appreciate every like, every view, every subscribe, every share. It means the absolute world for me. Thanks again. Hope you tune in next week, and I'll see you then. Have a good one.